Neeti, it's really I'm really excited to finally talk to you. You and Jessica have had lots of conversations over the last years. I've I've heard I've heard a lot about you from Jessica. I've heard a little bit about your story, but I'm really excited to finally speak to you, to finally meet you. Um, so I am here with. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the pronunciation of your name, please. So uh, I'm here with Neeti Bali, and we're gonna talk all about regenerating, life giving force. Um, Farm to Fork Meat Riot is her book. She's been promoting regenerative agriculture, regenerative food systems, and she's got a very interesting perspective on all this uh, due to her history and uh, her life story. So I'm really excited to hear all about Neeti's philosophy uh, about food, the reasons why locally produced regenerative agricultural uh, foods can be good for ourselves, for our health, uh, for our communities, for our families, uh, and for the big picture in general. Uh, Neeti, you're over. You're in the states, right? You're in the U.S. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. North East Carolina. Coast. All right. <laughs> All right. So from North Carolina to Ecuador, we've got we've got an international crew today talking about these issues. Neeti, how did you get interested in the ideas? Uh, that you've put forth here in your book, Farm to Fork Meat Riot, and the ideas that you've, uh, that you've been promoting, how did you become interested in food systems and in health? My evolution started, unfortunately, because we, we, we were just doing what is within the structure. You know, I'm, not, I'm calling it the structure. Um, <clears throat> meaning like, uh, you know, we're like everybody. We want to do a really good job. We want to, you know... Um, earn the grades, win the prize, uh, like be the best parents. I think everybody, you know, as a parent, you just want to do a really good job. Yeah. You just don't want to mess up with these kids, right? So um, we were doing that. And we were doing the best that we could based on what we knew. So if you're following the structure and just doing the best that you can, then I find, and I think that you guys uh, witness this all the time as well, is that we're, we were just being led down this path of lies. And in our case, our daughter, um, we had a son who had just been born and <laughs> I found out I was pregnant. We, we kept wondering, like, you know, all these people have trouble having kids and things like that. So we had thought, oh, you know, we hope we don't have any trouble. Well, we didn't have any trouble. And we had the first child. And then right behind that, we had a second child. Um, they were basically like, you know, just 13 months apart. So we, we didn't realize uh, how fast that would happen <laughs> or could happen. Yeah. And um, our dog, before we knew it, you know, like, uh, you know how it is when the babies are small and you don't really know what you're doing. You aren't sleeping and yeah. you're just doing the best that you can. And all of a sudden we find out that um, our, our daughter, just when I felt like I was kind of getting a grip on things, you know, like she was almost two and my son was three. I felt like, oh, I can like try to do something. Yeah. And I tried to figure out how I was going to get back into the world. And I, uh, I decided to take a job at the Y teaching preschool so that I could have the kids with me. And it's my first day going to, to, you know, this job and I find out, um, that I'm pregnant <laughs> with a third child. And yeah. I thought that was like the biggest problem that I was having. That was on a Friday. Then on yeah. Monday I found out, uh, my husband called me because Mina hadn't been feeling well and she hadn't been sleeping well. And we just thought she's just one of those kids that isn't a good sleeper or something. Yeah. And as it turns out, she had a head full of solid mass tumor. And at that moment, you know, you're just like, what is going on? Because I cook from home. I, you know, I don't know. I wasn't looking at things like you guys were studying everything. It felt like from watching you, listening to your stories and stuff. I feel like you guys were always trying to figure out how to be healthy. I was never doing anything like that. We were just... Mm -hmm living our lives. But I do come from a family. I mean, where, uh, we're a family, of, you know, they're a family of doctors. My yeah. grandfather was a renowned homeopathic physician when he was alive. So it was never that I've ever been raised anti 
medical institution or anything like that, you know? Yeah. You trusted, so, you trusted what you were told in the mainstream medical system. You just, you thought this was the best way and this is the, the right rip the right way to go. Right. I mean, we always kept a balance of everything. And of course we would be trying to use food first or, you know, but I was taught moderation. I wasn't taught yeah. anything else. And, and if I'm cooking from scratch, because I didn't know, I mean, I wasn't raised on Chef Boyardee or box yeah. food or anything like that. So if I'm going to the store to buy components to make a meal, I just expect chicken to be chicken or beef to be beef or whatever. I don't expect, yeah. you know, anything else. I don't believe that what I'm doing is a chemistry project, right? Because I'm taking parts and pieces of what is supposed to be whole foods and making it into something, yeah. right? And so, um, I mean, but that doesn't mean that we weren't taking advantage of conveniences, all right? Like, we ate at restaurants and stuff, but I also worked at TGI Fridays as a, a teenager wow. <laughs> in my 20s. And, yeah. and when I worked at TGI Fridays, it was back when it had the screaming bar, it had a real kitchen. Like, I used to do prep yeah. work there. I used to actually chop carrots and celery and whatever and like they cooked you know and like when we serve people if i had a table i was taking care of as a waitress you know and kids doesn't want to eat something i could scramble eggs and serve it for the child because we have yeah. eggs in the kitchen it wasn't like how it is today i don't even think people know what's going on in kitchens and restaurants anymore i mean so but at that time i had no reason to think that there was anything else going on right yeah and then as you enter the workplace or you become parents or something like that, now I'm not in the kitchen over there. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand how the industrialized food system is evolving or what's going on with it. I, I wouldn't have said that even. I wouldn't have known anything about it. Yeah, it wasn't on the but, radar. You, you, you weren't thinking about food as being a possible cause of this. I mean, so you, your kid was having difficulty sleeping. Was she crying a lot at night? Or I mean, what... How did you, how did you know, how did you realize that she had you know, uh, masses of tumors? She, she was really just not a good sleeper. There was nothing. She wouldn't cry. She would just be awake. Right. Yeah. And, um, and she would just be happily awake all night and we would just be like, please sleep. And then she would pass out in the daytime, you know? And so you just think her days and nights are mixed up or something like her circadian rhythm is off. I mean, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't sure yeah, she's what. teething maybe. She's having <laughs> trouble sleeping. She's a, you know, maybe she's got a stomach ache. Who knows? She wasn't complaining. She wasn't yeah. in pain, you know, like otherwise. But she just wouldn't sleep. And she was always smiling. This is the weird part. She would just be smiling. She was very otherwise content. Yeah. She wasn't trying to be complaining about anything. She wasn't yeah. like grabbing her head like as if it was in pain or anything. Mm -hmm. But that particular weekend, her head began to swell and she... Ha, had stopped eating and I was um, at a training and my husband was like, you know, she's not sleeping. I don't know what's going on. And um, so he takes her to the hospital or takes her to the doctor, just, just a physician. He's like, she can't breathe through her nose. We had, we never used medicine. We always used some type of homeopathy because I, that's what I knew. And um, that time we even tried Dimatap because we were like, I don't understand what's going on. And we gave her this medicine and even that wasn't working. So we go to the doctor and the doctor puts her on um, some kind of antibiotic. She wow. comes home and the next day her head is swelling. We go back. They decide that they need to send us in for a scan. So they send us to the hospital and we find out she has a head full of tumor. Yeah. What are you talking about? Like we were just like mind blown, like, what? And it's not a little tumor. It took over her entire sphenoid bone, like her entire rock bone in the head. Or oh, I don't know if you know what a sphenoid bone is, but it's the rock bone in a child's head that opens up into the sinus cavity eventually. Yeah. It's what makes the child's head so heavy, gives them that, you know, they don't have any balance. Yeah. So um, we're, I have to, I go in there and I'm like asking, I, I was like, I don't believe this. You know, I have to see the scan. I look at the scan and it's just, um, it's incredible that her entire head is full of tumor. Oh and goodness. we're like, what? So, yeah. you know, we're in shock, obviously. And now that's the moment where 
I find medical professionals now like irresponsible. And I can only say that after all these years, you know, yeah. like in retrospect, but at the moment I was just like, what, are, what are we supposed to do about this? Obviously I have to just listen to what they're saying because I have no idea. I can't Google anything. I didn't know what Google was. But yeah, these are the, the authorities. You, you believe that you should trust them. You know, this is obviously the peak of Western medicine. The peak of, uh, you know, scientific knowledge is being used here. So if you, we right. think we should trust it. So I follow whatever they're saying. We do an emergency room to emergency room transfer. I mean, in retrospect, I feel stupid because we literally allowed them to manipulate us. We didn't go home. We did, it was insane. We just end up at Duke Children's Hospital. And they're not feeding her or anything. I, I go into a lot of detail about this in the book. I really yeah. don't want to talk about that because it becomes very emotional. Yeah, but right. the long and the short of it was that we were at Duke. They didn't know what they were doing, which, I mean, they're telling you they don't know what they're doing because they're telling you they don't have a cure for cancer. Isn't that what they're constantly raising money for right now? I thought it's, they just say awareness now, right? Cancer awareness. Let's all be aware of all the cancer that's everywhere. You know, it doesn't, it's, oh, is, it's that, like, is that what it is? That's oh, what I, I see a lot. It's like, we're going to march for breast cancer <laughs> awareness, right? Let's all wear pink bands and raise awareness about breast cancer. It's almost, it, which seems really weird to me. It's almost like it's just normalizing it. Like let's ritualistically normalize yeah. that everybody's going to have cancer and let's recognize it and we'll be right. aware of it. And, you know, it's like, okay. You know, that, how about you know the... it's madness is what it is okay yeah, yeah you're right okay so they are it's a social engineering they're conditioning um yeah. absolutely i mean okay i forget who i'm talking to you understand social engineering so yeah. absolutely they're you know and they're normalizing it in television shows yeah it's just normal you're supposed to just do this and you're supposed to just but at that time it wasn't normal okay let's just start with that yeah but what's happening this... to this is 2007. Yeah. So this is like right when the internet's starting. I mean, the, the, the internet had been around for a while, but not everybody was online. Not everybody was, uh, there wasn't such a wealth of information as there is now back then. So I'm a mom at that time. Obviously I'm a stay at home mom and I don't have the latest tech. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's say that. But I do understand how to research old school. Right. Yeah. So my husband and I, when we were in the hospital, I had, we had split things up where he was researching latest therapies or most modern therapies. And I'm researching food and environment because of my background with a yeah. family of doctors. And I also don't believe, I mean, I think that the, the other thing was that I, uh, I think we were very unique in the sense that we just don't believe doctors are God. Mm -hmm. So, cause we know they're people because we come from families with doctors in them right <laughs> okay yeah. So, yeah. and they're all just people and so um whenever we would go to meet with the physicians then our parents were with us you know at least my mother was always with me because she's the kind of person who um helps i mean she, she's real calm and mm -hmm. really good at you know getting information um and so I mean, I feel like I'm like her too. Like we don't panic in a crisis. Everybody's very different. And you yeah. know that with all the coaching you guys do, like sometimes you'll, you, when you're working with families, especially if they have a child that's not well, a lot of times the parents are in a panic and they are always Absolutely. Panicked. Yeah. What am I going to do? I mean, you're completely overwhelmed. You're just trying to get by, just trying to put food on the table. And suddenly there's this, you know, horrific crisis that somebody has to deal with. I mean, this is nobody wants to go through this throws everything into limbo and you know just panic mode right and then you start looking for a solution and usually people end up accepting you know the the mainstream model of what well, we need to do chemo radiation therapy stuff like that so did you uh is that what you ended up doing you went the traditional route of treatment at the uh at the hospital well in our case at that time mina's head had been swelling hmm. and she couldn't breathe because literally the tumor is suffocating her from the inside out. It's behind right. her nose. It's, it was esthesio neuroblastoma, which is um, esthesio, meaning, um, yeah, esthesio neuroblastoma. So esthesio was of the sinus cavity yeah. and neuroblastoma means rapidly reproducing um, cells. Yeah. So the tumor, it was solid mass. It was had taken over her entire sphenoid bone. It was threatening 
her all her vital structures. It was wrapped around her carotid artery. It was um, just above her thyroid. It was, I mean, all of her her vital structures were being threatened. It was yeah. right behind her uh, optical nerve. So uh, the surgeon is saying we can't operate, you know, because it's kind of like cleaning a bathroom with a toothbrush. And I'm like, um, I can clean a bathroom with a toothbrush. I could show you how. And he's like, he says, no, you don't understand. She can't like stay under long enough for me to do anything. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's everything in the way. So they felt like the only thing that they knew that they could do would be to try to shrink the tumor so they could remove it because it was too big and it was, it was just tangled in with yeah. all the other vital structures. And by the way, when she was diagnosed, then they told us it was palliative at best. And so they didn't really believe that there was any solution that they could offer us. At which moment, you know, I'm like, why are they not sending you home and saying, enjoy your daughter? You know, they didn't do that. All right. So don't forget this part because they allowed us and said that they wanted to try to do treatment, not because we demanded it. Like we weren't those parents that were like, you must fix her. We're just like, what is the problem? Do you yeah. know what to do? You know? And I think the responsible response for them should have been, we don't know. There's nothing that we know that we can do right. that isn't going to make her less than whole. So enjoy her while you can and let us like maybe manage pain or something, you know, like yeah. that's what they should have said, but they didn't do that. And instead they basically used her as a pincushion and, you know, like some test subject in a lab. Right. And I talk about all of those details in the book. I mean, extensively, because we just sat there and basically watched them use her as a lab rat. And I remember being super pregnant, by the way, remember I'm pregnant. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was, that was amazing. That was awesome. Right. Yeah. I'm super pregnant and they, the meaning the doctors there were basically telling me that because I'm advocating for my daughter, that I'm in the way I'm interfering with their ability to treat her. And we're tape recording, by the way, like all of our conversations with the doctors. And we have our own kind of uh, tumor board that we created. And mm -hmm. we're talking to all our family physicians around the world. And they're consulting with all of their specialists. And, and we have access to these Ayurvedic specialists and these homeopathic specialists. And, you know, and everyone's telling us that they don't know what they can do. So no one was telling us yes. Let's just be very clear about this, okay? All the holistic physicians, all the everybody, no one is telling us that they have a solution for us or they're, nobody's saying, yes, we have something for you. We decide that we have to leave the hospital because do, because Harvard General Hospital finally tells us that they don't have a solution and that anything that they try is going to be leave her less than whole. And they finally don't, they make us, you know, because as parents, you want to go to the ends of the earth to have a solution to save your child. And you don't want to feel like you're not trying to save your child. And nobody's telling you actually in very plain words that you're not going to save your child. So until that moment, we felt like we had to investigate every medical possibility. And, uh, and then finally I was like, okay, we're going to go home and we're just going to do the best that we can. And I start finding out more about the food. I start realizing there's more to this food thing. And so I tell my husband, I'm like, you know, there's something about this food thing and I'm not, I don't get it. Like, I don't understand what's going on. What was on. the first thing that interested you as far as, you know, food and nutrition goes for, you know, cancer treatment or prevention? What was it that, that really made this stick out for you and that, that nailed it uh, into your consciousness and made you pursue this? If you're uh, approaching something from homeopathic or Ayurvedic perspective, you're going to look at the whole. So you're going to consider food and environment. And when Duke is saying this has nothing to do with food and environment, I'm like, really? That's insane, impossible. And so we're ignoring them in that aspect. And we went home in February of 2008. So you were done. You just felt like it was a, you know, you called it human torture therapy in the chapter in the book. But you, uh, you felt like this was just, there's nothing else we're, we're going to do here. We're going to bring her home and, and uh, you know, stop this madness. And it wasn't even that I just made that decision by myself. I mean, don't forget, General Hospital told my husband 
and I that there was nothing that they could do that was going to leave her less than whole. Yeah. And that gave us the confidence to just be like, okay, so we're going to try something else. And when we told our parents that we were going to try something else, I mean, my mother-in-law definitely was the first one to say, what are you doing? You're giving up. And I was like, no, but they don't know anything. That's why they're researching for cancer supposedly all the time, right? Yeah, you know, there was anything. no progress being made, and right. it was just, it, it was a torturous experience. Yeah, no, I, I don't blame you at all. I mean, a lot of people, right. they don't even elect to go the mainstream medical route. They just, they, they think that, you know, quality of life is going to be more important to focus on because um, the treatments right. just seem to be torturous. But you know what? Let's also say that she's two, mm-hmm. her metabolism is high and rapid, yeah. and you feel when you're trying to save your child, it's very different than if it, if it had been my diagnosis, then I would definitely not have rushed to yeah. do whatever, but yeah. it wasn't my diagnosis. It was for my child and a two year old's metabolism is so rapid that, you know, uh, one year in the life of a two year old is equivalent to 10 adult years mm. in terms of their metabolism. So that's why they want to research them in the hospital because they get 10 years worth of, uh, you know, scientific evidence or whatever for that drug. So that's the reason they want to use your kids as guinea pigs. I don't know if you guys know this. I don't know if anybody knows this, but children, when they're undergoing chemo, are always inpatient versus an adult that's always outpatient. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Um, And that is because they can be studied, um, you know, because their metabolism is so rapid that, you know, they can get 10 years worth of study off of a drug in the hospital versus, you know, otherwise. The food came on the radar and you start looking at nutrition. What did you learn about nutrition for, you know, a, a <clears throat> therapy, cancer therapy for the immune system? What, what did you learn and how did you start, um, you know, becoming so, so fascinated with uh, these ideas about nutrition for, uh, as a way of therapy and prevention and how did you come upon the food issue? So I didn't do it fast enough and I didn't do it in the ways that you would imagine because I didn't have internet. I only had medical journals to look through and I had farmers to talk with and I would have boots on the ground. And now that we're out of the hospital, I knew something was going on with the food and I could never really figure it out. And so it was just kind of like my innate thing. I had no, I cannot refer you to any medical thing or any document or any teaching that led me to, to this, it was my mother's instinct, honestly. Mm. Like I was just like, okay, I don't trust anything and I don't trust anybody. And I know I can't trace anything in the grocery store. So let's just start at a farmer's market. And then I started talking to farmers and I would say, my daughter's got cancer. We're working to try to do something about that. And I started asking them questions and I'm like, what do you know? What are you doing? What are your farming practices? Can I visit your farm? And I really don't know anything besides the fact that my gut told me that I need to just start doing that. And so I did. Right. And so the more I get to know the farmers and I tell them what's going on, I find that everybody is like walking on pins and needles around me because I'm at a market, you know, like talking to them at like a farmer's market. And when I got to know them a little bit better then I would go to their farm. And if, if, if I was able to go to their farm, which was interesting, I could, I wasn't allowed or invited to come to everybody's farm. Mm-hmm. So I, I was like, well, if I can't come to your farm, I'm just not going to buy anything from you because that didn't make any sense to me. If I don't have full transparency, I just didn't understand. And so I started going to people's homes. I got to know them. And what I learned is that the markets were centralized. It's a centralized food you know, distribution yeah. space. And so they're under the same centralized laws and rules of health and health code as in a grocery store. Well, I didn't know that. And so I was like, what does that mean? I don't understand. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you're buying produce at a farmer's market and they've washed it, if they tell you it's washed, it's clean. That means they had to wash it in bleach water. And if they haven't, I was like, oh my God, chlorine. Like, you know, immediately I'm Mm -hmm. like, we don't eat bleach. What are you talking about? Why would you put that in the water? You know, like I wouldn't wash my vegetables at home in bleach water. I would just 
rinse them if I was doing These animals to too, right? Like when they're washing chicken, when they're uh, you know processing meats, they get also dipped in bleach. Well, so the pasture raised birds in North Carolina, every mm. law, every state's different. Okay, in the state of North Carolina, the birds don't have to be dipped in bleach water, but the eggs have to be washed in bleach water mm-hmm. or in chlorinated water and yeah. produce. Produce. You want to know what? Even with not knowing about GMOs and not knowing about all of that, that the pork, soy-fed pork, but on pasture, okay? Soy-fed pork on pasture at that time was all she was wanting. Every The only thing that Mina wanted to eat was soy-fed pork. I mean, it was the pork. Yeah. Uh, the beef, but mostly the pork, never the chicken. Yeah. And not even fruits and vegetables. Like if she was choosing it and I let her choose whatever, because why not? I mean, we brought some things home from the market and if I could find it and I could go to the farm and I could vet it out yeah, and I could feel comfortable with it, if it made sense. Like I was, my, my, my homemade statement as at the time was if caveman didn't eat it, we don't need it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think about plants as not being available at that time. Really? You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't really think all that out but i did get away from anything else right yeah, yeah and if i couldn't figure out how to source it we didn't eat it so we didn't eliminate things because we knew about ketosis or anything like that we just eliminated it because we couldn't find it and we didn't know where it came from and like i couldn't have locally sourced sugar or mm-hmm. grain so that was the thing you wanted you wanted to be able to know that the food you were getting was the best quality as possible uh and, and ensure that you knew and you could confirm with the producers that this was quality food right so it was very basic it wasn't it was not as uh you know savvy you guys made very savvy decisions about food and things i was never looking at it from that perspective i was i think a lot of people's knowledge it's like you you're bouncing ideas off of other people you're talking to other people about these things i mean it seems like at the time there wasn't there wasn't as much information available to you you know, at that time, if you told somebody you couldn't eat something, you were offending their cooking skills. And that was yeah, about it. Yeah. You know, and so um, you couldn't tell somebody you don't eat whatever it is because that was rude. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like what we know now. So anyway, at that time, that's, that was my only standard was I have to be able to come to your farm and make sense of it. And if it makes sense, then we'll eat it. And if I can get it dirty, better. That's even better. I want dirty stuff that I can clean myself. And so we did that and we would bring it home. And do you know, we left the hospital in February and because I had nothing else to do and I'm pregnant and I've got these two small kids, I'm just driving from farm to farm. That was my everyday assignment was to just go to a different place. And so when I would figure out the food, I would bring some home. And then as I learned more, I came home and I talk about this in the book. I literally threw everything in my house in the garbage. I was like, I don't know what is in this house that is poisoning us, but it must just be everything. I don't know. I, I threw everything away. Spices, everything. My husband was like, um, what are we going to eat? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And, <laughs> yeah. and I said, I don't know, but nothing, everything that you see here, don't ever bring it back in this house again. <laughs> and, yeah. and that was kind of it. And, you know, uh, I was so pregnant. Otherwise, I think he would have probably wanted to, like, kick my butt for just throwing away yeah. everything in the house yeah. because I cleaned out freezers and everything. I mean, you're, you're, you're a husband who works for your money, who you know, just, just wants to throw everything in your house away. <laughs> what is going yeah. on? Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you, know, you, you had a, a lot of stress going on at the time, right? Like it'll put you in that kind of, you know, just freaked out, like manic state. Like we want to figure out what to do. What can we, what can I do about this? I, mean, I totally relate. I mean, you, you found something that you it was obviously important and, uh, and, and you really went into it. So, so you end up clearing the whole kitchen out. You're, you're sourcing all bathroom. your food direct and the bathroom. So all the beauty products, all the cleaning products, Everything. Yeah, no more hairspray, no more makeup, no more. I mean, all these, you look at some of the stuff that we're putting on ourselves, on our skin, uh, and our hair, the sodium lauryl sulfate, uh, the uh, all right. these things, and shampoos, all the uh, chemical 
uh, preservatives that are in the processed foods, so much of this shit that obviously has a n terrible effect on our immune system, been linked to cancers. So, I mean, it's, you start realizing all this stuff and it's like, oh my goodness, what the heck can I touch, right? Some people freak right. out. Some people just get like, some people, it, it mentally breaks them, right? They're either yeah. you know, paralyzed with fear or they become completely obsessed and make everybody miserable around them, telling them about everybody's dying, right? And it's like, how right. do you even deal with some of this stuff? It becomes like, a, it, it's so easy to freak out. What did you find out about the food system that you didn't like? And, um, I mean, this eventually led you to taking measures so you could affect this at a, at a bigger scale. As well, uh, you, yeah. I know you advocate for uh, patients now, and you're also advocating for food system changes. So what did you find out about the production of food that freaks you out so much? And, uh, and how did that spark you to actually take action and to make changes in your community and to, to you know, help organize ways that we can, uh, that we can change this? Everything. Everything. <laughs> I, yeah. I, it was it was so bad. It was so bad at the beginning, and I was so angry, and I couldn't even articulate what it was because I was so upset that, you know, like, why is this happening? But I'll tell you what it is now. Uh, Post-World War II, our food system was centralized, yeah. and um, they dismantled all our small family farms, and, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, this, this, during this, World this, War II as well, right? A lot of this started during the right. war. They started, well, first they, they told people, you know, grow your own vegetables, have the, the victory gardens and whatnot. As <laughs> they're doing this, telling people to grow their own vegetables, they're consolidating the grain supply. I mean, these uh, the, these grain producing companies, these petrochemical Monoculturing. companies. Monoculturing. I mean, yeah. what they're calling pharmaceutical was biological warfare. Right, they're these cancer it. drugs, these cancer right. drugs are literal, you know, they're biological injecting warfare. people with mustard gas for chemotherapy. Um, yes. and Monsanto and vaccines. is, so let's know. talk about that too. I mean, what I found out was after, after Mina died, okay, she died in 2009, but not before we had, had arrested her solid mass tumor and converted it into a cyst with just food, with just our lifestyle. Okay. So this tumor and that was with growing. me knowing nothing. Okay. Yeah. With, with lifestyle, with me knowing nothing, I didn't know anything. It wasn't even the cleanest food because I didn't even know what I know today. It wasn't even yeah. with the cleanest water. It was it wasn't even without wheat. She was still eating wheat because I didn't so know anything. The tumors about that. stopped growing and converted to cysts. So it stopped being metabolically active cancer tumor. Yes. Exactly. Wow. The the when we went in to uh, for them to read the MRI yeah. uh, results and they, they were like, you know, so the tumor has been arrested. So my mom is like, um, so are you saying that what my daughter is doing is working and what you were doing is not working? Is that what you're saying? I mean, you just spent uh, months, you spent almost a whole year treating her with the traditional route and you felt like right. it was just a torturous, um, slow, uh, slow, torturous It was growing death. the tumor. It yeah. was feeding the tumor and growing the tumor. And we put her on clean food and in four months she was... Her, her her solid mass tumor was necrotic was in horrible. four months. Yeah. And it might have happened faster than that. We don't know. We only tested yeah. it after four months. So it could, have, yeah. it could have happened faster than that. So if I could do that uh, with soy pork, okay? If I could do that with soy pork and wheat, because we didn't know not to give her wheat, but it wow. was wheat that we thought yeah. was clean, like from somebody who we knew local, yeah, who they didn't spread. It didn't go to a market. And we milled it and we made bread or whatever with it at home okay this is I so mean, crazy to me this is so you have so many people that get so freaked out about food quality right like it becomes right. really important i'm not trying to bash anybody who's concerned about food quality right when i use the word freaked out i mean i think we should we all probably should be a little bit freaked out about the way the food is being produced the petrochemicals we're ingesting and the chemical warfare yeah. that's being waged on us through this consolidated food supply of you know, junk kibble but we <laughs> Yeah. There's there are so many people out there trying to get their I health call back, it right? Poison in my book, poison. It's yeah. just poison. It's not food. Soison, the soison. So that we, <laughs> we get, we, uh, there's so many people trying to get their health back, and they start going towards you know carnivorous diet, ketogenic diet, and even mm -hmm. without having to focus on food quality, right? You have people getting supermarket meat and reversing serious health yeah. conditions. So this is always something okay. you know. I'm I'm very I'm I'm really big on uh, food system changes, and I'm going back to. Uh, you know, reducing the frag the fragile nature of the distribution of our food, going back towards small family farms, empowering rural people to produce their yes. own foods instead of genociding the rural populations, which is the goal of this consolidation right. food.
food supply, um, uh, global Correct. food system and this, you know, transnational food system. Uh, Correct. but so many people, they're, they're going to this grocery store, they're going to Walmart, they're getting ground beef and they're turning their health around. So right. I think this is a really interesting point that you're making here that your, your daughter was eating the soy pork, the soy fed pork, not the best quality, not food, even not the, the beef, best, not even the grass, not fed even beef. beef. The stuff that Mina ate was finished on grass outside, even with the grain, but on grass. Yeah. Okay. Outside. So not feedlot, not this, you know, industrial. No, no, no. This was in life force. So uh, although it was it was not uh, to the standard that I have it at today, but at that time, it's still superior to what you have in a grocery store. If you look at my report card, it's what I call a grade F. Mm -hmm. Like in my book, I I uh, have a report card that I created on how to how to grade the food. So yeah. you could still have animals on GMO feed, but because they're on grass and in the sun with their feet touching the soil, yeah, then they're able to chelate the poison. Did you know that a chicken on pasture with soy feed, okay, with, with crap feed, yeah. okay, uh, because for every three blades of grass that that chicken eats, it's chelating all that poison out of it. So the anti, it's funny because these anti-nutrients that we can't consume that actually do right. bind up to, to minerals, they also can bind up to metals and stuff like that. That's another yes. interesting part of this whole anti-nutrient talk that I think we need to get fleshed out a little bit more. I don't think that yes. it, anti-nutrients necessarily in these foods are inherently bad for everybody. Now, that doesn't mean that like, you know, I mean, so going on a low oxalate diet seems to be very beneficial, but I find it interesting that some people do perfectly fine and reverse their health without even doing some of these things. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance to this and how fascinating that these right. plants, they do, they're an intimate part of the immune system of the animal and the, the foods that they consume can have beneficial effects. You know, if they're on pasture, they could be chelating some of these poisons and these toxins that they're consuming from the food. Uh, just because they're living their natural lifestyle, they're you know in the you know the natural cycles of detoxification are are open in these animals. I think it's so interesting. You mentioned your report card when you talked about the uh, the way that the, the system that you came up with actually for actually grading food quality, right? So you started out you know you realized that the, there was a terrible uh, food quality issue and food distribution issue, especially in the United States and the West. Uh, you realize the importance of nutrition for our health, and uh, you saw firsthand the power of it when you know trying to do what you could for your daughter who had already been ravaged by the modern medical establishment. Um, what what is this report card, this food quality report card, and th th that you've developed, and how do you use it to rate food uh, and the quality of the sourcing of food? So bef let's not talk about food; it's animals. Mm -hmm. So this is livestock report card. Okay. And because as we both know, the only thing that really matters is the livestock. And that I'm not discounting the power of plant material, but what I'm saying is that um, it's very, very important to know and understand the livestock mm -hmm. for the circle of life, for the, for the hoop to be restored. First, I want to start by saying that the solution, the solvent for all the things that are ailing all of us in terms of health or any, any uh, uh, contrast that we're facing in life is love. And, and you and Jessica are a perfect demonstration of this because you've removed yourself from the structures, right? And if you follow the law of nature or any universal law, then all those laws have order nature has an order okay and that order requires you to follow these cycles okay and and all of that comes with love there should be no guilt about consuming these creatures who are who have that's their main purpose and people don't i don't understand you know like what the the institutions have created these 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 wicked blunders by uh, you know, our structures have kind of taken over and they've become the masters of us when structure is supposed to be what uh, what we use, um, you know, as our servant. And what I mean by that, I'll give you some examples of like, you know, like love builds your home, but structure holds the walls, you know, in place. Or like love built the nation, but structure administers 
uh, or administrates it, right? But love also means to stand firm in the midst of chaos and with patience and conviction that, you know, that you can hold uh, the piece, you know, you hold a piece of the unfolding puzzle. And that's what you and I are having a conversation about right now, right? And any, but, but, but words don't teach, Tristan, you know, only life experience teaches. And um, I don't want people to have to experience losing their child. So that's why I do try to use a lot of words. But, um, but at the end of the day, even, you know, I started, I preface my book by saying, you know, I hope that you can take some of your own life experience and, and, and follow these words and try to apply it in, in whatever context that you can understand it. But um, what I experienced by just following the laws of, of nature and, and honoring my circadian rhythm and just eating locally what was in season and, and making sure that everything was of it, you, you can call it highest quality, you can call it whatever you want, but I mean, if we were honoring the creature, right? If you're honoring the life, and then consuming it, then you have the perfect balance of everything. Because like we, we ate everything that we could find locally, but you know what? In North Carolina, you don't have fruits, mm -hmm. but for a couple of months out yeah. of the year, so you yeah, most of the world, a lot of fruit. you're not having sugar right. all year long. You know, what I mean, like you well, store certain things. We don't have bananas around here, right? There's fermentation. <laughs> there's you know, there's, right. there's ways to preserve carbohydrates, but um, you know, we do have animal foods available year round in most places in the world. Right. So we were leaning more heavily on animals naturally because, because that's all that was around. Do you, mm -hmm. do you follow what I'm saying? Like yeah. if you're, if you're following the law and you're following your local uh, production and not supplementing from the store, you know, I have a lot of rules with my CSA and I tell you know, people, I tell everybody, the first thing I say is don't tell me this is expensive. It's only expensive if you're supplementing things from the store. It's not expensive if you're only eating what you get from here, because what we have is going to be more nutrient dense and it will satiate you more and you won't need that much food. So what you think you need, you know, or what you are eating at the beginning versus what you'll eat after about six months, because that's about how long it takes for you to gain satiety, then you you'll be eating less and you can you, you won't have fruit all the time and you won't have certain things and you shouldn't supplement them from anywhere else. Mm. And so. I was following the law. I was following the, you know, just the natural law. If we couldn't, if I didn't know somebody who I could get it from around here locally within our circadian rhythm, right? Because then you have to eat based on circadian rhythm. Now I'm following light cycles and I'm not even trying to. I didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until I really thought about it later, right? Mm -hmm. But at the beginning when we were working just to help Mina or for anybody who just is getting started, I, that's why I say if you can't find it and you don't know who raised it, don't eat it. Because you can't raise anything locally that isn't supposed to be growing. Locally. So that and that's why you created this CSA, right? Uh, it is. And do, what is a CSA for people who haven't heard of a CSA? What is a CSA? Why did you start it, and, and what the heck does it? What's what's the function of it? So I didn't know what it was going to be called because I didn't know what it was, and then I started looking because then I, now I have Google, so I looked it up, and I was like, oh, okay. So what I call this is a third-party community-supported agricultural program. Mm -hmm. and uh, community-supported agriculture. So normally, a traditional CSA is a farmer starts a buying club, kind of, if you want to call it a buying club, but they seek investors in their crops. It's, it's may, mostly started with produce, okay? So uh, the community would help fund all the seeds and all the labor and whatever has to go in uh, by purchasing shares of what's going to be grown on this farm, and then they equally divide it. Well, there was nothing at the time set up that way for meat or animals. And all I cared about was the animals because it seemed like you could, you know, try to grow your own food in your backyard or you could find produce everywhere, but you couldn't, I couldn't hold, have a cow in my backyard or yeah. whatever. Well, yeah. yeah and you're not going to so, feed your whole family off of plants that you grow in your backyard either. Right. I mean, you, you require well, animal. Yeah. If you want to have a locally uh, sourced diet, you're not going to be eating you know, plant-based diet of processed protein powders and, you know, a hundred different types of beans and legumes and uh, grains and seeds. You can't grow and, beans and legumes. Yeah, so, or you processing know. seeds and nuts, right? <laughs> you can't grow enough of these foods. 
you know, that's something People I learned too. People don't know what it takes to grow rice or grow wheat or grow whatever. I'm like, how yeah. many acres of land do you have? Right. And we're talking about people who don't even know how to chop an onion, Tristan. They're not mm -hmm. growing like an actual plant, okay? Yeah. Or, or never mind harvesting grain. In order to protect these it. plants too, to keep them, to keep pests away, to keep predators from consuming them. I mean, this is just having a vegetable garden. Uh, it, you're not going to grow enough food to feed even one person for a week, no matter, <laughs> you know, the, the average person, especially um, that doesn't have land, that doesn't have much space to use for growing foods. It, it, it's just not reasonable. So, yeah, the locally well, produced animal foods I, seem like the only way to go for feeding us locally. OK, I will say urban gardens can grow enough plant matter. Is that going to satiate you? Is it going to satisfy you? I don't think so. No, protein and fat. But, you're not going to grow protein and fat in an urban right. garden. You're not going to grow protein and fat that you need. And you can't grow the plant version of that, which would be only coming from the seeds and the grains. So mm. you can't do that. And it's not sustainable. And you can try it and prove us wrong, but we already know that you can't do that. Yeah. So uh, with the lives, yeah, I was only caring about the meat. And so yeah. you, when, you, when you start breaking up a cow, there, you can't have equal parts of all parts of the cow for all the people the same way that you would have a zucchini or the way that you would have cabbage or something else. So I had to figure out a system. And so I, I, as an eater, I created uh, what I was looking for, which is that I wanted to be able to a la carte purchase what I needed, the parts that I liked, and not maybe have all the parts. Yeah. And, and collectively, we could consume nose to tail. So that was how I started it. And then I started it with education. And what I learned is that nobody really knows how to cook. So fast forward to now, 10 years later, what I do, what I've done in the past 10 years is I've taught people how to cook. I've taught, I also know how to cut an animal. And if mm. I got to grind the whole thing just because we need more ground because people don't know how to use various cuts, I yeah. just don't see what the problem is because we're going to consume it nose to tail. And yeah. If, it, if that means I need to just grind the whole cow, then it's not a bad deal because that way every, you know, we don't have to have ribeyes for everybody. Yeah. And uh, so, so I've learned a lot of things along the way, but the, the long and the short of that is that, you know, the entire creature can be consumed. If we have, if we're raising and honoring the life of the creature, the way that it is meant to be, it is far more medicinal and the cleaner that we got, because Tristan, I learned about, GMOs in 2009, then I uh, put it into effect in 2013 that we were no longer using GMOs at all, no GMO feed or anything with any of the creatures, no soy. Mm -hmm. And as I got cleaner and cleaner with the, with the animals, with the livestock, which is what the report card is telling you, is outlining like the report card, the cleaner I got, then those animals were nourishing us even more even better even faster, so you felt a difference in the less. food quality the better quality food you had the better quality animals you had you f felt it you felt the difference i mean not just me hundreds of people did and yeah. it's amazing because you know the, the and i always what was interesting is i always knew which families were only eating from the csa and which families were supplementing from outside the csa because the ones that were only eating from the csa would buy less and less and less over time and the ones that were supplementing were eating more and more and more because that's how much that the bad food or whatever else that they were consuming was chelating the nutrition out of their bodies. Isn't that mm. interesting? Like mm. they were eating from here and there. So you can't have one leg in and one leg out. So when you're, when you you're can't... purchasing from the CSA, it's like you're buying – how does it actually work? And how does – you know when you're, somebody's purchasing from a CSA like yours, what does that mean? You know, what, what does that mean for like the, the, the food, where it comes from? Right, so you mentioned a community-supported agriculture, right? So the, what does this mean when somebody's purchasing from a CSA? So the way I set it up was like my own psychological operation because I had to break out of the structure and create my own thing. Yeah. And so um, the way it works here is you can purchase one of three ways. So you can buy a la carte, which is piecemeal, like you just want chicken breasts or whatever it is that you want. That's the most expensive way to shop. Mm -hmm. You can buy in what I call bulk, which means that you can have this. We also have subscriptions like weekly and monthly subscriptions. So we've created like, for example, two chickens equals one subscription of chicken. You can get it whole or you can get it cut up. And um, the reason you have to have two is because it just doesn't make sense to just have wings from one bird. 
It yeah. makes more, it's more fun to have two birds worth of wings at least. Mm. So um, for that reason, we decided that everything was going to be two birds as far as chicken goes. As far as beef goes, we have it set up so that the boxes have uh, six pounds of ground as a baseline and 10 pounds of a mix. Mm. Or you could get just ground because maybe you don't know how to cook a lot of things. Mm. Or you could just get ground and stew because you don't know how to make steaks or you don't care. You just want yeah. stewed meat and ground. Or you could have any combination of these things, right? And so I created these various increments that help us consume the animal whole. And, um, and people can purchase and participate at whatever level that they want. I have college students that come here and shop every week. And so when people tell me that's unaffordable, I'm like, it's only unaffordable for you if you are still supplementing from the grocery store. If you're only buying food from here, you're going to eat less food over time. And it's very affordable. And in fact, it's so affordable that, you know, you will start to lower your food bill eventually over time. So people are able to purchase, you know, bulk and, you know, you, because people are, you consolidate the purchases, right? Because you have different people that are buying these uh, bits. You're able to, um, you know, make bulk purchases and then pass on the savings to the members of the CSA. Right. And they're supporting the farms directly because if you have a subscription or you're buying a bulk box, you're paying the farmer directly. Mm -hmm. If you want a la carte stuff, it's something that you're buying out of my garage that you're going to pay me full retail for. Mm -hmm. And so it allows me to offer the farms um, a deal where I have a relationship with them where I say, I'm going to come, I commit to giving you 80% full retail and only taking 20% wholesale. And that's the only way that they can actually reestablish and get a foothold on the market and grow because yeah. we're reestablishing a food system that was totally dismantled. It was, I mean, like our food system is collapsing because uh, structure is fake. Structure is imitation. Structure are these lies that yeah. everybody's coveting. And the truth is under love and the law, right? So if you're going to follow the law, if you want to actually have regeneration, you have to follow the law. And the cool thing is like you and I, well, I was talking with Jessica, like about butcher box. You guys had started supporting butcher box at one point. Mm. And, and I was like concerned about it because they were importing meat. You know, they were importing grass fed beef. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is the, the most affordable beef in the U S because of the way they structured it in this globalist globalization, uh, food supply system, they make it to where Australian imported grass fed beef is cheaper than u.s grass-fed beef right so it's like for the right. consumer who just wants to get good quality meat uh they're gonna buy what's most affordable and systematically they make it to where these imported things are more affordable which is ridiculous right it, you should be able to purchase in your local environment and most people can if they look around they can get more affordable stuff but yeah and it's, better it's, quality mm, so i, yeah, I want to speak crazy. i want to speak to that because you know I think the cool thing about importing and supporting Australian beef is I, I, I was able to meet the Aussies who were doing this in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to go see one of my mentors, Alan Savory. We had a global reunion. And so, you know, everybody was there from around the globe, including the Australian beef producers. Mm -hmm. So I was able to talk to them and I found out like, you know, Tasmania, if anybody really understands what's going on in Tasmania, they are, you know, it's, it's like a third world country in that sense that they, uh, they're decertifying and they're desperately using the beeves to regenerate the land. Okay. And so is that the highest quality nutrition for those beeves? Uh, no, but it's good that they're not using chemicals or pharmaceuticals or uh, like vaccinations there because they can't afford to do that. Hmm. Okay. And, but what are they doing to that meat in the import process is the only thing that I am not very clear about. It's the only thing I couldn't really get like a clear, a clean picture about. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying don't support this Tasmanian beef because what you're doing is you're financially supporting the regeneration of that land and supporting their, uh, reestablishing their aquifers that are about to collapse. Okay. So it's a very big, important deal that's happening, but it would be an F on my report card because the nutrition for that livestock is nowhere near what it would be if you read the rest of the report card. It's mm -hmm. not the most ideal conditions. Those beef. Well, yeah. So what you're saying is, you know, grass-fed beef. There's a whole range. Something can be grass-fed, 
and there could be a huge range of quality. There could be a massive difference between one grass-fed, grass-finished uh, animal and another grass-fed, grass-finished animal. And that's what you kind of are doing with your report card. You found ways to grade producers on quality using several metrics, right? Right. And they're all good. So I don't want any producer to believe that if you're an A through an F, that you're bad. You're not bad. You're amazing. You're great because you're a regenerative farmer. You're doing something amazing to, you're like the phoenix rising from the ashes is what's happening out in Tasmania. I'm not bad. It's so crazy how, you know, there's so many people that want good food, that want good quality food, but there's so few people producing food. There's so few people, and this is the, the consolidated food system has created mm -hmm. this factory farming behemoth. Yeah. That then the plant-based, you know, the, these people that are out there in the streets uh, protesting and they want a plant-based future, this climate alarmist uh, war propaganda that we see going on now, it's talking about further consolidating the food supply, further empowering the consolidation of companies like Dow, Syngenta, Cargo, Monsanto, uh, Bayer Pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. all these massive corporations that, are, uh, that have created the factory farming system are using the factory farming system as a straw man to take out the small farmer, to take out the small producer by saying, look, we're going to increase efficiency, we're going to reduce greenhouse gases with all this magical thinking about carbon dioxide and how we're going to stop the greenhouse effect. This is the biggest uh, uh, you know, problem in the world is CO2. They've completely blindsided you uh, and, and blinded you to the realities of the biggest polluters in the world consolidating the food supply even more in the name of saving the planet. So it's it's really, really backwards what we see now. And, you know, it's, I mean, as somebody who we're trying to produce our own food, right? Like we're trying to, uh, you know, to get to a point where we're able to produce our own food off our own land. But there's such little knowledge out there. There's so few people that are actually doing this. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I've you know, been trying to network, talk to people like you. You mentioned Alan Savory, the Savory Institute. These are the principles that we're going to try to to implement but over the here Institute in our homestead. Institute isn't doing it. Let's be clear. It's people Tristan. that are doing it, right? It's the people. So Alan was doing it. His, now he's institutionalized, right? Mm. So um, <laughs> I, I love what you're saying. I, I, I made some notes because I wanted to make right. sure I remember to get a couple of points across. So I want to I want to say a couple of things. If that's cool. all right. But like what you talk about right there, all of that, what you just said, look, in society, there's, uh, you know, structure is most protected by those who have attained what they want. And ironically, they have so little, the thought of losing it is unbearable. So they blindly obey it, right? This is the people. This is the people, the, the corporatocracy, all right? That's who the structure is. Mm. And and they can't, they can't even lose 1%. You know this, right? They'll, they will, they're fighting and killing over it. And, and the, and the uh, society is just blindly obeying it because even they are living in this uh, scarcity mindset. Okay. And the true wealth only comes um, like with the harvest of love and, and, and honoring the laws and knowing that nature has grace. If you're working out with your feet in the dirt, if you got boots on the ground, you know nature has grace. It's amazing. Like that's what is happening in Tasmania, right? Tasmania, they are about to lose all their aquifers. This means they will not have water. They will be fully decertified, okay? But they're using these animals to regenerate the land because nature has grace, because, because the well-being is everywhere. And these folks that you're talking about, they have this scarcity mindset, right? And that's our institutions. And what we need to do is stop participating in the institutions, which is the reason why the book it has a hashtag, get out of the grocery store. Hmm. And, you know, but everyone feels that they are unable to afford it or how are they going to manage it because it's so complicated, it's so hard. It's not hard. I mean, even if they don't do anything, but get the butcher box, okay? But scarcity is an aspect of structure, which again is the corporatocracy, right? And so it's a self-perpetuating problem with no solution. And no matter how large or complex these structures ever get, they're going to deteriorate, they're collapsing. And, you know, but meanwhile, the, the universe and all the laws of nature and everything is constantly expanding. It's always expanding, even your knowledge is expanding. When have you ever regressed with your ability to learn more? Like, like never, right? 
And so what, what I'm saying is that our, I, I want our message to be really hopeful for these people, Tristan, because they're so angry, they can't see the solution that's right before their eyes. And they don't know that there is no scarcity. They need to get out of the scarcity mindset and they need to know that nature is abundant and the abundance is everywhere, but they're not allowing themselves to experience that. Just like what I was telling you about the garden, right? But the same thing happens with the animals. The animals, you can't have plants without animals. What do these people think they're going to be doing in the lab pretty soon? If they're right now, they're making a fake crap out of some stuff that they're growing. But if you don't have water because you don't have plants and you don't have, you don't have plants and you don't have grass without the animals, how is this going to work? It's a cycle. It's a circle. You have to preserve the hoop. So uh, what is their solution for that? And we're just well, the all goal seems around. to be just you close up the loop a little bit more. You make resources seem more and more scarce. You make resources more and more expensive through taxation schemes and you decrease the human population as much as you can by squeezing them out of you know, food producing jobs and only cultivating people who will just consume right without producing anything. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're do you want to know something interesting? And I'm interrupting you. I'm sorry, but I'm interrupting no, you right now because check this out. The more I expose people or demonstrate for people, and then they are able to have their own experience and then choose this, right? The more they choose this, the more they choose this. They can't choose anything else. Once you've experienced health, you're not going to settle for anything less than all of that, okay? Mm -hmm. And so what these people do is they stick with me. And do you know that my prices used to be way higher than the grocery store? Mm -hmm. And now they're almost on the verge of the tipping point of being lower. Do yeah. you know that? Do you That's know cool. that my beef, if you, if you get my beef, uh, you, if you go to the grocery store and you buy grass fed beef around here, it's about uh, somewhere between 975 and 1025 a pound. Okay. And the conventional crap shit beef that I saw the other day, it was like between six and $8 a pound. So not mm -hmm. very far. Mm -hmm. Okay. And our uh, subscriptions for our, our highest quality A grade beef is um, 925 a pound. Mm -hmm. it's not going to be very much longer and we get to maintain our prices because our we're re regenerating our soil and our prices are just coming down because our investment costs for the original infrastructure of fencing and everything and water yeah. and all that stuff is going down and so our our pastures are just becoming more and more abundant and healthier and the mm. soil health is and, and as you cut out, out the middleman and you know the people are paying the farmer directly for the food that yes. decreases the price as well so it seems like as if if this model becomes even if uh, they pay for shipping even yeah. if they pay for the shipping it is practically equal to the conventional crap in the store yeah so and if, if people continue to support this they're gonna be more and more producers who are able to make a living off of this rather than getting yes. squeezed out by the big consolidated uh, you know, weaponized food system that we have, you can yeah. actually empower rural people to produce food again, which is what the system does not want, right? They want everything automated. They want all the seeds to be planted by drones. They want massive fields They're of industrial agriculture. It. They're already doing this and they want to They're pull out. The, yeah. They want to make gasoline and resources so expensive so people cannot drive vehicles, so that they cannot transport food, so you can't even live in a rural area, so that everybody's right. on public transport in these smart city coffin apartments. This is the goal of, you know, then the UN, these big corporations behind the UN, the big banks. That's the future that they see rural populations gone, genocided, destroyed systematically through economic measures, but also they're looking at you know p potential other ways of depopulating rural areas, which you see happening in the third world very often uh, you know, through destabilization of nations and through austerity mm -hmm. measures. They want these people gone. But if we can mm -hmm. you know, uh, produce food and we locally... Can. Yeah. Not, not just can we, we can. Because yeah. in a state of separation... They, they, we will, sh you know, right now we're in a state of separation. It's an art of war style, divide and conquer mentality where they've put men against women and women against men, wives against husbands and husbands yeah. against wives and uh, confused everybody about what they are and who they are and all this other nonsense. Mm -hmm. They wanted to create every possible uh, psychological operation to create division in every, I mean, like you, people are fighting over everything besides like how to label a bathroom door or whatever this crap is. Everything beside and, anything that matters, they want you fighting over. While right. the infrastructure and, gets taken out from beneath your feet and a new structure gets erected, they want you to beg for the new structure that they've already planned mm -hmm. out. And that's which what they is have these frail and it's counterfeit. 
It's yeah. a counterfeit, frail structure. By design. And by design because it's a consolidated, top-down, vertically integrated structure globally of global production of all resources and a monoculture, a global monoculture where you don't have local identity, where you have planetary global citizenship, where you're a good global citizen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Which you know, are this lies. Is, these, these are yeah. lies, okay? Yeah. Those are lies. So the truth is that you can master the wholeness. We're teaching you the wholeness. I mean, what you guys, what you and Jessica are teaching everybody all the time is the wholeness. What I'm saying is the wholeness. How do we get back to the wholeness? You guys are focusing on coaching people and creating this community where they can get together and support each other. And my focus is just creating the conversation. I'm, I'm trying to be the liaison between the eater and the farmer because, you know, Joel Salatin is one of my mentors and he just now understood me because you know he, he was saying to me, he was saying to me Nipi, what is wrong with you like why are you pushing this soy free uh, issue why are you trying to push pork to be grain free or whatever what you know do you just want to be crazy like you're just trying to make it make give trying one to make more it harder <laughs> you're just make trying to harder. make give one more reason for us farmers to fail and you know he's been fighting the system for years right yeah. and so he's like are you just you know like what is wrong with you he says to me and i said I said, but Joel, I said, they call me Mithi, the pharmacist, because I'm prescribing food as medicine. And these people who are part of this structure that are chemically damaged, they cannot eat the meat that is an F or a D or a C on my report card. And it's a C or a D or an F because it's consuming the industrialized soy, even if mm. it is organic soy, you know, whatever. And, yeah. and so I'm saying to him, I said, this is medicine. This is their prescription. This is the prescription. And I need people like Tristan and uh, anyone else who's out there coaching to be able to prescribe this meat that is clean, that is not going to affect people who are chemically sensitive. You so, when you, all right, so the soy, the soy pork, right? Like we're, we're, we're looking at maybe getting some, uh, some pigs and feeding them whey. Right, so I know that, that that's one thing. I that got could even be better useful. ideas. Mm. I got even a better solution. You could do that, but we have even better solutions, and that is what I'm doing: is working with the rogue farmers, who are on a uh, incubator level, uh, creating and testing these things. I mean, you can call them theories, but I mean, we're not killing or torturing animals. You know, we're not. The animals are fine. The worst thing we've done so far is had the pigs so lean because they were became carnivores. Because we were we we were trying to raise them on fish carcasses. Because if you read in my book, I talk about that. And I've actually already advanced. Like I need to take out probably my chapter fifteen where I'm talking about how to go feed free. Because we've since then advanced even further to realize that you know. And and actually, Joel came down and he's been working with us and and advising and, and pointing out some of the uh, things that were probably working against us. Um, mm -hmm. because we were trying to create more of a natural habitat, you know, for, for the, for the hogs. And yep. we were giving them a little bit too much freedom for us to be able to actually fatten them up on, on something besides like, you know, if we don't want to. Well, because I mean, what I'm, I'm looking at is ways that I can feed the animals all just off of local resources, not having to import anything. Yes. So like we live in the Andes, right. there's not fish heads available everywhere. Right. So no, like, no, we no. have to import fish carcasses. So it's like, we're trying to figure out ways that we can use just input from the direct environment or we don't want to have the animals, right? So we're looking at having sheep and cattle right yeah. now. You know, we have a small area that we're working with, but you know, right. we've got a lot of work that we have to do that we can't financially swing right now. Anyways, as far as fencing sure. goes, we need to try to figure right. out mobile electric fences. Uh, right. We need to increase the size of the uh, of the groups of animals that we have. So, I mean, we've got and a long way to go, and unfortunately. And small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. We, we've got if a long way to go. If you have fewer animals, just... you can mob them up a little bit tighter, but you could also use sunflower shoots. You can also use barley fodder, barley grass, mm -hmm. you know, to help fatten. So there's a lot more things that we can we have. We about. have molasses readily available, right? So there's a yes. lot of sugar cane that gets produced in these areas. And there's, right. you know, we can get molasses for, you know, big, you know, 10 gallon, uh, 20 gallon jug. I forget how many gallons it is, but we get big jugs of molasses. Barrels probably. It, <laughs> yeah, it does great for the, for the cattle. Molasses is great. You know, whenever I see the cow, she always... Uh, her breath reeks of molasses. She loves it. Yeah. Uh, so that works to fatten them up in, in the drier season. Yes. But we also have like six months of plenty of pasture. So we're looking at, you know, pasturing animals, using chickens, 
Uh, yes. the pork, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting one because here everyone feeds the pork, the pigs, they all get fed balanceado, which is basically kibble, right? It's kibble made from, it's oh. imported. Most of it's made from oh. corn and soy. So that's why we oh. don't even eat the beef or the, uh, the pork here for the most part, uh, because oh. nobody we know raises good animals that are fed, you know, good quality feed. So we were thinking when we're making, do you cheese, have an we'll abundance of whey? Do you have an abundance we of milk? We're going to have, well, she's pregnant. Our, our heifer is about to give birth within the next, it could be days. Like you could see it kicking in the side of it. She's all lopsided and she's yeah. super pregnant right now. So she's about to give birth and we're going to have milk really soon. And then we've got another uh, calf that within a year is going to be producing. And, you know, if we can, if we can afford it, we want to purchase some more already producing uh, uh, heifers that will give us milk, right. some milk cows. So we're looking to have yeah. at least, you know, I don't know, 20 to 30 liters of milk a day w realistically within a few months um, if we can afford it to you know, bring more animals in. So, yeah, we should yeah. have some, but it you know, won't be more than won't be more than probably 30 liters of milk that we're producing per day, which would mean we would maybe turn 20 of that. We might sell 10 liters a day, turn 20 of that into cheese and then have yes. the whey from that. And then so. have the whey, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so you could definitely use the whey and um, I could get whey, I've got a friend, I, we got, sorry to interrupt, we got friends who have a dairy. Mm -hmm. We could buy mm -hmm. barrels of whey from these people to get it for free from a lot of them. Oh, between, well then if you have that access. See, everybody has to be innovative in whatever area they are. And mm -hmm. there are, there's an abundance of something somewhere in each area, you just have to, be innovative enough to realize that you can do that. And you know what's interesting that I'm discovering is that they've made the um, idea of animal uh, feed rations as complicated as they tried to make nourishing us, which we already know is doesn't have to be that complicated. Well, I mean, they know more eat. about feeding animals than they do about feeding humans, right? They know that if you don't feed pigs enough vitamin A, they're going to be born retarded with not properly functioning central nervous systems. So it's, it's funny, we know even more about animal feeding and implement it more. Farmers know more about mm -hmm. feeding animals than doctors know about feeding humans. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I mean, and you know what's interesting, too, is the other, oh, speaking of that, farmers, my farmers te have taught me so much that, you know, when we went GMO-free, uh, all of a sudden, the egg production went up. Hmm. Isn't that amazing? We, got, we took the soy out, and all of a sudden, the um, the birds were laying more we put them on yeah. fodder I wonder if the, if the estrogens we, were were an issue mm -hmm. i don't know you know like I don't what about know, corn probably. because we hear a lot of corn yeah. is produced right you can get we yeah. can get sacks of organically produced corn locally at the same time it's like you know the fatty acid profile is not gonna be as good as they're just right. eating bugs but we do we need to bring some sort of feed in for, for these animals to locally produce organic corn uh, uh -huh. they still produce a lot of eggs so we don't give them any soy but the corn, that's another thing. A lot of people, they're feeding the you chickens give them GMO. Sprouts. You could give them the sun, sunflower shoots or sprouts. Do you, have, do you have any way to access sunflowers? I mean, yeah, it's just it's, it's less available seeds. than corn, right? Corn's a lot easier to grow here. When you say that regenerative has been bastardized, what do you mean? I mean that nowadays everybody's so busy saying, oh, everything's regenerative now. I got like, you know, <laughs> I see... Uh, I see a lot of holistic physicians now saying that they're having, you know, they have regenerative practices and they're selling supplements. I'm like, uh, that's not regenerative. Okay. Regenerative means, uh, and for me, it means wholeness. Okay. It means that you are, are keeping the hoop so that it doesn't require any efforting. If you're having to do a whole lot of efforting to feed your animals, when you guys get your operation fenced in and set up the way that you want it to be, then make sure it's always ease and flow. If, if you're efforting too much, mm. then it's not regenerative. I'm not saying there's no husbandry involved, okay? Like there's husbandry involved, but, but it no, should you're, be- You're talking easy. about not bringing in a bunch of outside input, not having to you know, uh, truck in you know, thousands of pounds of fertilizer all the time, right? Like I mean, real regenerative agriculture should be you know, with minimal input from the outside, areas producing food you know without the need for a bunch of petrochemicals pharmaceutical drugs you uh, should need numbers. nobody tristan yeah. if you were to take your corn and sprout it in the way that you have access to mm. and feed that to the hogs they're not going to be able to digest that because they're like us omnivores they'll just poop it back out okay so when they do they're reseeding it for themselves for you to for it to come back that's regeneration do you follow? Yeah, so yeah. whatever you're doing, and they're re-inoculating the soil with that as well. And then 
that is regeneration. So you don't have to fertilize. You don't have to do literally anything except move them from here to there. So here, here, piggy, piggy, and move them to the next area and have them move from, you know, concentrated space to concentrated space and hopefully have it in such a way that you can not have them on the same piece, piece of land for their entire eight months while you're growing them out to process. Yeah. And then start the next group. And that is the goal, right? So you're using the land and the space and you're leveraging the power of the universe to create medicine. Yeah, I think it, I think the uh, the food systems, I, this is such an important piece of the puzzle. You know, people are actually supporting locally produced foods. I love that you've created a model of this, uh, you know, through the CSA to kind of uh, empower people to be able to make these purchases directly from the farms. I know there are a lot of loopholes that you've had to jump through, and you talk about a lot of this in the book, why you had to structure things in the way you did in order to bypass a lot of the hard to manage loops, bureaucracies, and all the bullshit you got to deal with in the system. Um, I really suggest people check out her book, uh, Farm to Fork Meat Riot. Uh, this is a a really, really important piece of the puzzle here, regenerative agriculture, community building, and uh, you know, actually creating a system of food production that's not so fragile, that's not so toxic, and that's not so difficult and expensive. Um, Niti, where can people find more of your work? Do you have a website? Do you have anywhere you would direct people to learn more? And if you have any you know, closing thoughts that, uh, that we forgot to hit on, I know you and I could probably talk all day. I would love to actually meet you in person. Maybe someday you can come, you can come rate our farm if we ever uh, you know, get things up to standards for uh, for ourselves we'd love to uh to have you come take a look um but yeah. you know yeah well, where can they find your work what's your website yeah. and what so more do the, we we the website is um farm to fork meat riot dot org that's f-a-r-m-t-o-f-o-r-k-m-e-a-t dot org we want to invite all eaters to become active and participate what we want to do is i believe we want to not participate in the institutions because our institutions are only a reflection of the people and if the people want the institutions to change you know once once an institution is formed tristan then it no longer behaves as a human so now that institution can make you know one wicked blunder after another and uh, murder people and it's not it's no longer responsible as a human anymore so I don't mean that there aren't well-meaning people who are in these institutions who are doing things, but as a collective, they're making these, you know, blunders because they're having to satisfy this division, which is the structure, right? The mm. structure is divided. If everybody would just sit down or just don't go to the grocery store and, or just decide to not buy their meat at the grocery store, yeah. Even, you know, yeah. then. Well, just um, moving towards that, taking one step, like you said, once you got one foot in the door, uh, yeah. it, 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 you're hooked, right? Like, you know, the actual sourcing of your food, it becomes such a, it becomes so fun. It becomes so important that then a lot of people end up wanting to produce their own food too. want to get involved in this sort of stuff, yeah. want to get involved in advocacy, want to get involved in building CSAs like you did. So yeah, I think if you just put your foot in the door and start moving towards these solutions, things do open up and things do start to become more clear. Uh, yeah. and, and there are solutions to this, but we just, we do need to take action, you know, and taking action doesn't And I mean... would love to help you guys. I would love to help anybody who wants to do it. I mean, if you guys know farmers in your area that you feel are not doing a great job, you, you want them to maybe do better. And they say they don't just don't know how to do it. I would love to talk to them. That is the purpose of our nonprofit, which is what we're, we're currently, you know, what we want is to seek funding, Tristan, so that we can create the demonstration space. Like as, as someone who's trying to do it clean, wouldn't you love to be able to just know that you can always look to our demonstration to learn the leading edge uh, concepts. And yeah, then yeah. from there, you know, we could, uh, we wanna be able to, um, what the goal is for online, we wanna be able to create an online education system where we're showing you the leading edge things that we're doing in our incubator style farming situations mm -hmm. at all times. And uh, I was, you know, I'm eager to be able to have some funding to be able to just go and go to wherever everybody is and, and like kind of collectively 
um, you know, collect these leading edge ideas and, and the people that think they're doing the most leading edge, if I can help them do it a little bit better or faster cool. or whatever. Yeah. Well, then, that's great. Hey, when you got yeah. funding, come out here and fix our farm. <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you got funding, send me an electric fence and, and, uh, and 100 well, we sheep. we are a 501c3 <laughs> nonprofit. That's cool. So I think it's important for people to know that because, yeah. because the consumers don't know what they don't know and the, and the producers don't know what they don't know. And mm. so instead of, you know, of, of slamming them, because I don't think that the consumers are stupid. I think they just don't know anything better. That's all. And They've if been they misinformed have... intentionally. We've been misinformed intentionally. Right. And if we right. start to become aware, then, then we could start taking steps. But yeah, I mean, it, we got to recognize the problems first and then we can start implementing right. solutions. Right. And we know what the problem is. And, you know, you guys, you guys know and we know. And so I, you know, thank you so much for allowing you know me to be be here and have this conversation with you and um, and I hope that you know we've inspired somebody to you know take a new step or a new look at you know at, at how they can approach uh, their lifestyle and I hope that people know that nature has grace and you know you have there's always it's not just hope there is a solution and you can you know the well-being is everywhere but there's right. just no lens on it. There's no lens on the well-being. So I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to put a lens on the well-being. Amazing. All right. Well, Nithi, thank you so much. It's been so great finally meeting you. Uh, I know you and Jessica have had some great conversations, and I uh, really enjoy looking through your book. I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna, I've got to actually sit down and and properly give it a read. Uh, you know, I know Jessica's reviewed it, and she really liked it, and. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective and helping people to connect with farmers and supporting locally produced foods. I think this is incredibly important. Um, so w what is your website again? Where can people find more? www.farmtoforkmeatriot.org. And they can also follow Neepy the Pharmacist on uh, Facebook, or they can uh, follow Farm to Fork Meat on Twitter and um, Nithi the Pharmacist on Instagram. When you say pharmacist, how's that spelled? F-A-R-M-A-C-I-S-T. Farm as in farmer. Okay, Nithi yes. the Pharmacist. That's N-I-T-I, -I, the pharmacist with an F, like farmer. Um, great. Yes, Thank you so much. You guys can find more at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. See you guys next time. Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed this episode and if you like it, please share it with all your friends and if you are interested in knowing my story or learning about the nonprofit work that I do, then please read my book. I'll make sure that there's a link in the notes and while you're at our website, then you know, you could become a sustainer and help support regenerative agriculture. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time.